Well, um, in my term paper, uh, I will be investigating uh, a gene amber and the modes in which it was circulated through trade with other societies of Europe during the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Um, and I got kind of on this whole uh, track because I came across this article um, by uh, Ricard uh, Janko, Janko um, who uh, a found or was part of a, a group uh, that found uh, these amber objects um, in uh, southern Bavaria, which is a southern East Germany, uh, at Bernstorf. Um, which are, and these, this pieces of amber and another, uh, seem to both be inscribed with linear B. Um, and that, uh, and for the chronologic, chronological, um, uh, you know, uh, dating uh, from 1350 to 1200 uh, doesn't make uh, a ton of sense uh, in most of the ways that we think about uh, trade um, going uh, from the northern areas of Europe uh, to the southern and then back. Um, and so uh, initially I was skeptical myself, uh, but uh, through using uh, his arguments um, and uh, those of other scholars, I, I hope to sway even the most skeptical of minds, uh, such as mine too, um, in, uh, it, with my research that I've done over the past couple months. Uh, so this, this object B from Bernstorff, uh, as I said, dates from 1350 to 1200, um, and that's by using uh, scientific methods and through uh, the objects that were found around it. That is, seems to be the best dating that they've been able to do. Um, and this inscription we'll go into later, uh, but it uh, this, this amber, uh, what I, I would argue is a seal stone, um, looks much like uh, many other seal stones which we have in Mycenaean context as it also has a hole for, uh, for stringing the stone um, uh, upon, upon, a, upon a rope or a, a wristband, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and so uh, many scholars, though, uh, do bring up that they believe that uh, this item and the other I item of amber found at Bernstorff are, are forgeries. Um, there's a lot of uh, very, very uh, wide-ranging uh, opinions uh, about them, but uh, I, um, I tend to lean towards uh, Yonko's um, idea that, that these are legitimate, and uh, we will go into more uh, why, why I believe so. Um, and so uh, in reference to the seal stones, uh, I know Stephen has also looked at the seal stone, um, and we looked at it when we were all at the a, &A Museum, uh, but it uh, has certain similarities, certainly with the hole size and placement of this hole. And where we think, um, how, how we think uh, Mycenaeans would have worn this and the amber uh, stone, which they found at Bernstorff, is possibly um, depicted in this fresco from uh, the Mycenaean uh, Citadel House uh, around the uh, late Helladic III period. Um, and this is as a wristband, possibly. Um, many scholars believe that these seal stones were worn around the wrist to be uh, easily uh, accessible to imprint into wax or um, or use as a uh, a symbol of, of legitimacy of their uh, right to trade. So um, you ask yourself, how did that get there um, when thinking about this? a uh, piece of amber in Bernstorff uh, in, engraved or incised with linear B. It seems to not make a whole lot of sense. Um, and so uh, we will uh, together uh, map the, uh, the movements of this amber uh, from uh, most likely the Baltic coast uh, down to the Black Sea. So the, here is where, uh, is where Bernstorff is, um, where it is circled there. Um, this red line is uh, possibly from either uh, glacial melts or, um, or from intermediate trade, how this amber would have found its way south from the Baltic to the, um, to the Black Sea. Uh, in the uh, Neolithic period uh, or pre-Neolithic period in the last ice age when it was ending, um, many of the glaciers uh, brought um, chunks of amber south 
uh, on their flow. And so they can be found in the riverbeds, uh, even in the Danube. Uh, and so from, from the Black Sea, uh, this item, uh, these items of amber would have been traded uh, with the yellow line there uh, to the Aegean and Mycenaean lands. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, sea trade in a moment. Uh, and then from uh, Mycenae, where it was inscribed, uh, this item uh, would then have found its way back to Bernstorff. And how, uh, how and why uh, it, uh, it is found there, we will discuss further, um, as I'm going to promote that I believe it has something to do with um, mercenary service. Uh, and as you can see on this map here, it is showing uh, shield uh, finds um, from across Europe uh, used in different contexts, but they are all uh, part of this um, V and U notched shields, uh, which uh, the, um, the scholar Christian Christiansen uh, believes uh, are part of a distribution of these shields uh, is evidence of a global uh, Bronze Age maritime world, um, a pan-European economic and political in independence can be traced back uh, at least to the Bronze Age. Uh, he believes. And so um, that is supported also by, uh, by the rock art, which you can see in the map is the, um, the uh, hashed areas where you have uh, shared rock art. And even on some of these, um, in, on one of these uh, rock art um, locations, they believe they found uh, the outline of a oxhide ingot which we will talk uh, a little more about in, in a moment also on um, these oxide ingots and, uh, and their significance in this trade um, network. So uh, the, also um, I would, would hate to uh, overlook the Ulu uh, Brun um, shipwreck off the coast of South um, Turkey. And there we find Baltic amber uh, as well as Italian swords. And this certainly attests to the, the wide range of trade goods which are uh, being passed through the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, as well as their connection uh, to uh, places further north. And, uh, and the Italian swords, we will also discuss in a moment as they are part of a, um, a very interesting uh, spread of weapons through, this, uh, through the European um, region. So going back to Bernstorff, uh, this is a, a, a diachronic view of, uh, of this settlement. Uh, now it is a small uh, Bavarian hamlet, uh, not many people there. However, um, back in the Middle Bronze Age, it was the largest fortification uh, set uh, north of the Alps. Um, as you can see, there's an artist representation. And here is a, um, an outline of, of where they found these wooden fortifications. Um, and there in the area in red, uh, you can see that, oh, well, you can't see there, but um, in the area in red is where this, uh, this amber was found, as well as the other items which it was found with, which we will go into um, more, more fully in a moment. So back to amber object B, this inscribed, uh, in, incised, uh, Linear B inscription, and the uh, the scholars of uh, of Linear B um, have argued a few different possibilities. One being uh, pan panawati, um, possibly meaning something like uh, princeps, a uh, a leader uh, of people, or um, the possibility of it being uh, a backwards inscription uh, for pressing into something, being ti noa pa possibly a uh, miswritten uh, or vernacular version uh, of an ethnic adjective uh, likely used for those of the Western Peloponnese. And we know this uh, from the Pylos tablets, um, which are uh, some of our best, uh, our best evidence about Linear B in looking for, um, for, for words uh, that, uh, that, are, um, that are known, what they, what they mean. And so, uh, the object B was found uh, still, um, also this is an interesting uh, element of it. It was found um, still to be surrounded by a matrix of local clay and sand. So that would be local to Bernstorff, clay and sand. 
preserving the glowing or magical nature of amber, which is present in the first 20 to 30 years of its exposure to open air before it oxidizes. And so this, this is part of why the people who believe that it's a forgery believe it's a forgery is because when they pulled it out of the ground and they cracked this ceiling around it, it was still glowing almost as if it had just um, been put there. But um, it seems that uh, chemically, the glowing can be prolonged uh, by uh, its, its seal being sealed within a, uh, a clay-like um, uh, a ceiling, in which, uh, which this, they seem to have known about and which they uh, certainly used to protect it. And so this item uh, has certainly some sort of strange significance um, to the people uh, who, who carried it uh, from, from Mycenae to, uh, to Bernstorff there in, there in southern Germany. Uh, another item which was found with it uh, is amber object A which on the obverse has a bearded male head, this kind of uh, funny grinning looking guy. And on the reverse, uh, another inscription that might be linear B. This one is a little harder to, uh, to understand, uh, but um, they believe either Ka D, um, which has no parallel in it, or D Ka, um, which the closest parallel uh, in linear B would be the be Mount uh, Dikte in, on Crete, uh, D Ka Ta. And so uh, if, if that is so, that would be a very interesting um, element to follow up on as we find very few items uh, actually on Crete uh, that are amber. We find uh, a few in the, the very uh, latest stages of the Bronze Age, but um, even at, at uh, the period that it is placed when there are um, a very few amber items found on Crete. Uh, the, uh, Janko also uh, pur purports that um, this, uh, this could have been done by a scribe who was uh, an illiterate provincial, um, which would make sense uh, if he was from the Ti Nuato uh, on the periphery of the, of the uh, Pylian kingdom. And so if this person who inscribed this really didn't know Linear B very well or was using a vernacular speech, it would make more sense that, um, that we don't have any other parallels to it and that it is, uh, it is somewhat of an anomaly. So with these items, uh, these two amber items, about I think 20, 20 meters away or less, um, this gold regalia um, was found at Bernstorff. Um, and it was first dated uh, to the 16th or 15th centuries BC because the style of the gold work was compared with that of rich finds from the shaft grave in Circle A at My Mycenae, uh, however, lab testing has pointed to, uh, to a later date of 1389 uh, to 1216 BCE. Um, and the, the, the quality of this gold is 99.9%, .9%, so at the very top um, quality, um, things that we really only have comparisons with uh, in Anatolia and Egypt. Um, I, I only think there's one or two comparisons of gold of this high of quality in, in Greece. Um, in Crete. And so this is rather, um, rather strange. Uh, and so uh, the crown also uh, shows traces of uh, Southern Arabic incense um, having been burnt uh, near it, uh, which could possibly indicate some sort of ritual context if these items were placed upon uh, a statue rather than worn by a person. And, and there was incense burned nearby. Um, and also, we find that, that the, uh, the gold sheet jewelry here was, was folded and deposited as a hoard, um, seemingly uh, with, with great care, in that they, um, they intentionally placed it the way they did. Uh, and so that either um, points to uh, what could be a funerary context, uh, if the body had been burnt, and then the gold items deposited, or some sort of, uh, of cultic items, which would go with the traces of incense. Uh, so how, how would it have been worn though, um, either by a person or by, uh, by a anthropomorphic statue? And this is, uh, this is one uh, interpretation by, uh, by a museum um, in Germany. And they seem to think that, you know, this crown and uh, you have a kind of fibulae like purpose to the long piece, um, a pin, uh, a scepter, a uh, belt, and uh, armband and necklace. 
So quite a quite an intricate um, uh, amount of regalia uh, to be found so far out of the context of where uh, it is thought to have been made. Um, but this all does kind of make you think of Schliemann and uh, and him putting his wife in in the um, King Priam's gold. And so uh, you know uh, how much veracity to, there is to this side of the argument. Uh, I even I'm then still skeptical. I'm definitely not. Um, completely uh, on board on, on how this would have been worn or, or, its, or, its, or its uses. So going back to the items, um, the, the, sorry, the trade networks of, of Europe here in the Bronze Age. So in the 15th and 14th centuries, uh, this map here uh, shows distribution of amber, oxides, Mycenaean pottery, and swords. Uh, you can see the uh, the um, key is down at the bottom of the map. Um, a maritime uh, Mediterranean uh, trade network uh, seems to be linked with this land-based trade network. Um, not likely that there were single traders traveling these great distances at this time, but certainly a uh, a linked trade network of between different groups in these different zones. Um, however, it seems to connect uh, southern uh, Scandinavia, specifically uh, southern Sweden and Denmark, uh, with uh, Central Europe, and then Central Europe uh, with the Mediterranean, uh, both going to Italy and, uh, and to uh, Greece, Mycenae. Um, as you can see here also, the uh, oxide ingots um, are placed uh, there in, in the Greek area on, on Sardinia and then some in the Carpathian Basin and a few in, uh, in central Germany. And so it seems, uh, uh, some scholars believe, that these oxide ingots were part of what was being traded to the, uh, to the north uh, from, from the uh, eastern Mediterranean. Um, and, and also it seems that uh, a lot of Mycenaean pottery was being, uh, being traded to uh, southern Italy, which uh, I can imagine Mattia probably has plenty to say about. Um, but uh, these items then uh, seem to be traded possibly for uh, what, what some scholars would argue are, are for swords um, and for, for weaponry or for even mercenary uh, service. So here uh, is a uh, typological uh, um, map, uh, two maps uh, of the diversity of metal artifacts found in the third and second century millennia BCE. The, on the left, we have the earlier millennia. Um, uh, there is, seems to be some amount of uh, diversity in metal artifacts, but uh, nowhere near what we find in the second millennia as trade seems to ramp up and different kinds of items are traded all across the, uh, the continent. And that leads us to uh, a group of swords called the Nauwe Type II swords, um, uh, which uh, seem to be have originated uh, in the Carpathian Basin, but also uh, taken, a, taken a very uh, big liking to in, in Denmark and northern Germany. You can see on the map here, the, um, certainly the epicenters of their, uh, their find likelihood are, are there in those two regions. However, we do find uh, a good amount uh, in eastern Crete and on uh, mainland Greece. Um, and this is, uh, we will look in a second at the chronology of when they are found, but they even go as far as, uh, as we can see here, the Levant and Egypt too. So the dating of these Nauwe II type swords um, are almost exclusively uh, from uh, relative fine contexts, uh, pottery and timber dating. Uh, and the same is true with, uh, with the amber items uh, that we're talking about. Uh, it's very hard sometimes to, to date these things. Amber has a, a whole uh, spectrum of uh, possibilities um, of its, the rap rapidity of its uh, oxidization and change. So uh, it's hard sometimes to get an exact date. Um, but by, by comparing uh, the items that these uh, swords are found, with we uh, we see here on this map that the um, the earliest uh, definitive dating finds we have of, of these swords uh, come from Italy and uh, and Carpathia. 
Um, and, and from these regions, we see that, uh, that very likely these, this type of sword uh, was developed and then spread outwards both to Mycenae and to, uh, to Denmark, where it's much harder in, uh, in the north to get, uh, to get more exact dating uh, numbers. Um, we also find uh, a spread of armaments uh, shields, uh, corslets, helmets, greaves, um, uh, along with these swords. Um, one uh, scholar uh, from the mid 20th century, Hector Catling, argues that uh, for an originating uh, from north of the Mediterranean area and that they were brought south by mercenaries and, and spread between uh, these different groups. Um, it's difficult to distinguish weapons brought by mercenaries and those uh, made by traveling craftsmen, though. And so the the argument certainly has uh, has possible validity, but uh, but there are many scholars which question um, question it. However, uh, the this distribution uh, does point to a possible movement of mercenaries from the north uh, to the Aegean, as uh, you see uh, certain typesets of these uh, of these helmets and and shields uh, coming from, as we talked about earlier, the shields uh, coming from the north uh, to the south and vice versa. So get on with it. Um, uh, I need to get on with, with how to link these two things together. Uh, this uh, mercenary service, uh, these weapons, uh, the gold to the amber finds with linear B. Uh, so what do the golden weapons tell us about the amber? Uh, a strong correlation, uh, this is by uh, Christian uh, Christiansen and Paula uh, Paulina, Tuzowska uh, Duque, sorry. Uh, um, they both uh, uh, work together. He, uh, he was her um, uh, teacher at one point, and now they uh, have uh, published several things together, um, making these different uh, arguments about mercenary service and its, uh, its importance in these early Bronze Age trade networks. Um, they believe a, a strong correlation between traders and warriors, which can be used as a proxy evidence uh, for cross-cultural communication. Uh, long distance mobility influenced uh, central and peripheral regions alike, as this, this trade um, between these groups uh, doesn't go one way. Uh, the, uh, the cultures uh, from, from Northern and Central Europe uh, certainly also influence those in the Mediterranean as the Mediterranean ones certainly influenced them. And so we see these European societies increasingly adopting features uh, from palladial centers in the Eastern Mediterranean, which in turn adopted both warriors and valuable products from the European hinterlands. So back to uh, Richard uh, uh, Ricard, uh, um, Yanko's big uh, question. Uh, if this amber from Bavaria was incised with linear B, while in the Western Peloponnese and is not fake, how did it reach Bernstorff and why? Um, and there seems to be uh, three, uh, three main possibilities. It was uh, traded by the Mycenaeans, uh, having already been inscribed uh, to people. Uh, it was taken for them, uh, from them by force, by some sort of marauding uh, group. Um, if you wanna attach the, uh, the sea peoples into all this, uh, you certainly can, some scholars do. I'm a little hesitant to go so far as that though. Um, but also uh, what could be linked to that too is this paid for service of some kind. Uh, and then the most obvious kind of service, uh, they, uh, he, he points to, and both of these other scholars um, certainly back up, the most obvious kind of service uh, would be as a force of mercenaries um, where we have um, plenty of, uh, of written evidence, um, both from uh, the Iliad and uh, and even from the Pylos tablets, uh, of uh, there being mercenaries uh, in the service of these early uh, early Mycenaean kings in the Bronze Age, and there there certainly is some sort of connection there. And so uh, to push forward even on uh, Yanko's uh, ideas, uh, you could go so far as to say. Um, the gold was worn by some sort of uh, Mycenaean princeps or, um, or periphery uh, nobility who uh, traveled to Bernstorff 
um, wanting to trade for mercenaries or goods, but, uh, but possibly died uh, along the way. And then his, uh, his or, or hers uh, goods were, were cremated. Um, his, their body was cremated and the goods were then buried in this very ritualistic fashion. Um, or, 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 you know, who knows what the actual uh, provenance of these items are but uh, but it certainly is very interesting, and it certainly shows uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, space of these items being traded between different groups of people. So um, this is a very cut down uh, bibliography, pretty much what I used for the presentation. Um, and yeah, I guess if anybody has any questions, let me know. Um. Yeah, are there any questions that people have? Um, I have one, I think, possibly. <laughs> um, going back to your conclusion, Conrad, so just a slide right before, um, you'd mentioned that they're finding some of this evidence of mercenaries from the Iliad and the Pylos tablets. Um, but I wanted to ask to see if you, if they found any evidence of the mercenaries possibly in Linear B, because I know you're discussing Linear B within them. Um, yeah, and I the didn't know if there's... Tablets, the Pylos tablets are Linear B. Oh, I thought it was a completely different thing, so never mind then. Yeah, yeah. so um, I don't know if there's other evidence. People kind of talked like there was more evidence, but I didn't see anything else referenced that said that they believe this means mercenary service. Um, the Pylos tablets were the only ones, because they're a pretty complete uh, royal record. Um, as it as it goes for linear B, pretty complete. Um, but yeah, those seem to be the the best linear B evidence. Well, it's good that you have linear B evidence because the Iliad is hit or miss a bit. Yeah, so so it has to do with the the um, the Greek uh, words used for many of the people who are fighting on the Trojan side. Um, mm -hmm. The words used for the kings who were fight for the Trojans. Um, actually mean uh, someone who uh, they exchange uh, something for alliance for rather than they are subservient kingdoms or something. Um, and yeah, so it's just more of an issue of dating the Iliad. Oh, yeah, well, certainly. Than anything else. Like, they could be using old terms, but, you know, yeah. how old are they? But no, the, the, the tablets are good that you have those two. Yeah. So I have a quick question about, um, do we have any evidence for like Central Europeans uh, in, um, in Mycenaean context? Because I guess the other argument is that could be like a Central European mice, uh, mercenary that went to, you know, the Aegean and brought this back or something like that. Um, or is it just, are people just looking for Mycenaeans in Central European context? Like, is it, is there any evidence for something, you know, like switched? where you actually have uh, non-Mycenaeans in Mycenaean contexts like that? Yeah, that's, that's I think, one of the harder things to, uh, to really be able to, to define. Um, uh, I mean, they're not being, as far as I understand, like a term that we have for other, these other groups of people. There's kind of like terms for local people in, my, in Linear B, mm -hmm. but... Um, there's not like a Barbaroi term, as far as I understand. Right. Um, but do you mean in the archaeological record? Um, yeah, or like, you know, I don't know if anyone's kind of brought that up, up the fact that it might just be someone um, who, you know, like it might be a Central European who themselves, you know, served in Mycenae and brought back, you know. Yeah, world. yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, that's definitely one of the other things that, that you could, that they they put forward certainly is mm -hmm. that um, someone who came from Central Europe uh, mm -hmm. to Mycenae served uh, as uh, as some sort of mercenary or or in some some capacity maybe just traded and then brought these items back. Mm -hmm. um, so no, it doesn't have to be that a Mycenaean went to Central. Yeah, Europe. yeah. Because the gold is interesting because I wonder if anyone sourced that, see where it's coming from, um, like where the gold itself is. You know, because I don't know much about Central European. Um, I mean, I, I know that they have gold <laughs> because we do have a lot of rich cemeteries, um, you know, in... It's usually not as high quality. Right. And it was 99.9% .9 pure. Mm -hmm. that's, that certainly pointed to an uh, Eastern Mediterranean context. Yeah. Um, I, I 
don't know. I don't remember if there was like scientific data for that though. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's kind of interesting. Never seen that before. Yeah, I hadn't either. That's why I kind of latched onto it. I was like, this would be interesting. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of like dovetails off of your question, Emma. Mm -hmm. um, so just like with the Mycenaeans and trading, are we saying that like the trade is happening from like Pelos, it's happening from Crete? Like, is there interna interaction between those places in Bavaria? Yes, uh, they do believe that there is um, maybe not directly to Bavaria, but to uh, regions closer who then do trade with with them. Um, there seems to be a good amount of uh, items that are that are uh, traded between them. Yes. So um, yeah, and it's specifically you're saying it's in this area that I guess the Peloponnese and then some areas of eastern Crete. Um. Yes, yes, that the most trading seems to be done uh, with the northern context of, of their um, trade partners. Yeah, um, and that's, that's substantiated by the, the shields, uh, the swords, uh, the oxide ingots, um, all seem to point to, uh, to that network. And maybe you said this in one of your slides when you were going over the linear B inscriptions, but I'm wondering, if there was anything in linear B, probably not, that could indicate um, that there was some trade going on, like maybe some name that says Bavaria or whatever burned <laughs> off. Yeah, uh, well, we don't know what they called it then. We're yeah. not even completely sure what language was spoken there in Central uh, Europe yeah. at the time. So uh, some sort of proto in the European, Germanic, Celtic, uh, no clue. Well, that's a good question too. How the hell were they even communicating? But that's a you know, it's for another day. Yeah. I mean, there you got to go to like Herodotus, how he describes the the Carthaginians trading with the Iberians, uh, leaving their goods um, somewhere in a designated spot, and the Iberians leaving their goods, and both sides, you know, leaving goods until they're both happy, and then they take the opposite goods. Um, and that, that's, that's substantiated in other places other than just Herodotus. <laughs> but um, that seems there's silent, silent trade and communication is something in the ancient world. Certainly.